Before we get too far into this, you should have a ShockWiz connected to your fork or your shock, and you should have downloaded the ShockWiz app to your phone so that you can connect to the ShockWiz. After that, go ahead and go through the calibration process that's outlined in ShockWiz app and do all the steps to get this set up so that you can start collecting data and do your tuning from there. I set up my fork with all the standard settings as recommended in the Fox manual. I have a Fox 34. Went out, connected the ShockWiz, rode at Lake Decrees uh, City Park, then went and rode at um, Hoston Park in Gaston County. That gave me a ton of data. It was recommending a couple of things. It recommended that I lower my air pressure, recommended that I decrease the number of volume spacers, uh, recommended that I change my rebound settings, it recommended that I change my compression setting. So first things first, don't change everything. Change one thing. So first thing to change is air pressure. So getting the air pressure right is, is kind of the first step. The app is really intuitive. So here you can see baseline air pressure, and it's saying that it's on the remove air side, but you need to move it towards the OK. So I need to actually add air because it's down in the remove air section. So if you look, there's color indicators. So green says no adjustment, yellow is a 5% change, red's a 10% change. Follow along with what it does, and its recommendations are pretty good to get you in the ballpark. You can see that all the others have the same thing. There's lots of information there. It tells you explanations of what things mean, how to adjust them on your fork. Don't freak out if your fork or shock doesn't have all of the adjustments. Um, that's pretty normal. Mine doesn't have high speed compression and low speed compression. It's just got compression. It's just got rebound. You can also choose your tuning style and that really helps with how you want the bike to feel and you kind of look at it that way and go from there. It was telling me to change my air pressure by 10%, so reduce it. So reduce my air pressure by 10% and then set a new baseline air pressure in the shock with so that it knew that that was where the starting point was. And so we went yesterday and rode at Rocky Knob in Boone. Very um, more aggressive trails, more aggressive riding. Great place to, to really do some, some testing of the shock. So came home yesterday, looked at the shock whiz, and it was telling me that my air pressure was good, and it was telling me that I needed to reduce the number of uh, volume spacers in my fork. So for those of you that don't know, so these are volume reducers or volume spacers. RockShox calls them tokens. The RockShox system, they screw together, screw apart. The Fox system, they snap together and snap apart. So you can kind of snap more on and more off. So you have a certain size air chamber inside of your fork. As the fork leg comes up, the air in that chamber, which is pressurized, increases in pressure as it gets compressed. The air can only compress so much. This is why filling something with air and it explodes, uh, as soon as it can't hold the, the pressure anymore, it'll explode out. Your fork's not going to explode, but you get the idea. So this chamber, if I decrease its volume with spacers, then the amount of space that is available for the air to compress in isn't as much. So the air will ramp up its pressure dramatically. So that pressure that you have initially will dramatically increase as you go through the travel and get harder and harder. If you decrease the volume reducers and increase the amount of space that it's got, it will take a lot longer before it gets incompressible. For lighter riders, having a larger volume means that you can run the shock a little bit more supple 
and then still have it where it's not going to bottom out dramatically all the time. So that's kind of where we're at. For bigger riders, they're going to add more volume reducers so that they can still run the shock soft, but then as it starts to blow through the travel, they'll get the full range of the travel and it will not bottom out as bad. So that's sort of the idea behind volume reducers. So I've got to remove the volume reducer from my port. So first things first, I'm going to disconnect the shock whiz. I disconnected the shock whiz from the air chamber and now I'm going to let the air out. You can see there's not a lot of air inside of a fork. That's why you don't use four pumps because then it will push way more air in there than is necessary. All right. So now I need to get a socket and remove this piece in order to access where those tokens go. All right, now that we've got our air out of our chamber, we are going to loosen this top cap. and we're going to remove one. And then reinstall. Reconnect the shock whiz. Right. And then with the shock was in place, it actually has an air valve. And I'm going to pressurize the shock through the air valve on the shock whiz. So the shock whiz has the shock whiz has a very accurate pressure gauge um, that you look at through the app. And so I'm going to use that to get my air pressure dialed in exactly where I want it and then set my baseline air pressure and then test again. So we will gather more data and go from there. Cool. After riding Beach Mountain uh, lift rides yesterday and then Emerald Outback today, I got a lot of good data from the shock whiz on rear shock so it's telling me I need to re remove one volume spacer and this is the volume reducer uh, that was in here so um, I'm already pulled it out but kind of show you the process in reverse so this is just hand tight super easy um, the volume spacer sits on this shaft and up in here so pulled that out and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of just a super thin cut on the threads there to make sure I get good seal again. And then I'm going to push these guys back up. They were actually holding that volume reducer in place and then slide the can back up and then start threading it back in.
All right, now I'm just going to pressurize it back up to uh, my pressure, which is 135 pounds, and go from there. So all the changes that I made on this were changing the air pressure, changing the rebound settings, changing a little bit of the compression settings, um, and that's done with the three-position remote or three-position switch here, um, and just putting it to the softer position rather than the firmer position. And that just gives more plushness to the shock. And then the rebound, it needed to slow down more so that it wasn't popping quite as much, um, which was causing it to buck the rear end a little bit. So I slowed that down, changed the air pressure. Now I've removed the volume spacer, the volume reducer. So all in all, it should feel very different um, and better for my weight. But thanks to the shock was it was all pretty easy. And so now... I've been able to do the rear suspension and the front suspension on this bike ahead of the Beach Mountain Enduro next weekend and feeling pretty comfortable with my suspension setup after doing runs this weekend. So look forward to Saturday testing and then Sunday racing. It's been a few weeks since I shot all that and did all the work with the Shockwiz. First things first, I really want to thank everybody at Lightning Cycles. Uh, they allowed me the use of the Shockwiz so that I can make the video and they have one available for anyone to go and check out and use and get their shock dialed in and that's why i wanted to make this video so that it would show people just how easy it is to to work with the shock whiz and definitely after a month of riding with a freshly tuned uh, suspension setup after working with the shock whiz my bike rides much better than it did uh, with me just sort of like fiddling around with things. I've talked with other people and they really kind of put down the shock whiz, but I think for a consumer getting started in suspension, um, for people that have ridden suspension for a long time but not really done any tuning on it, uh, it gives a lot of great information. Um, I think it's a great starting point for people that are wanting to get more into working with their suspension because I'll tell you a lot of times um, just getting your suspension tuned makes your bike feel much much better and it's a great investment in both money and time um, taking the time to set up your suspension correctly is well worthwhile and will make a big difference in how your bike rides the downside that I see with the shock whiz um, it's it is expensive so on a consumer level like I mean I got three people riding different suspension setups in my household, so I can kind of maybe justify buying one. Um, but for a shop to buy one and then rent it out for periods of time to people, I think that's a great way to do it. So you might want to talk to your shop and just say, hey, I'd love to rent one of these, and I think you can make some money off of it and make your money back at least. Uh, so you know, think about that and see if you don't want to invest in one. The downside to it, though, other than that, is you don't see any of the raw data. Uh, if you've looked at the testing that downhill teams do, um, they'll have lots of linear actuators that they put on the suspension, and they're gathering mountains and mountains of data, and they're crunching all that to check out suspension setups and leverage ratios and all kinds of information that they're looking for with the bikes. And while that's way beyond consumer level, I think even just the shock whiz giving you a look at the data that it is gathering, that would be really helpful for the person who wants to go a little bit deeper. It gives a little bit deeper dive. And that shouldn't be a really difficult thing for them to incorporate into the app. So you can sort of have different levels within the app that you can look at and do your tuning from there and that perhaps would make it a bit more powerful for a really seasoned rider who's looking for a really good suspension setup but can't afford the multi-thousand dollar linear actuator systems that places like Fox and these big pro teams are utilizing for their suspension setups. So kind of, you know, giving you a little baby step into that world. Other than that, though, I think it's well worth the time and money to get a hold of a shock whiz and use it to set up your suspension. Even if you've been doing it for a long time, um, you know, talking with 
some of the um, people at Lightning, and they were kind of talking about how it kind of, you know, unlocked a few things for them that they hadn't really thought about. And I think that's important. You know, the more data we can gather, the more information we can get on what the bike is actually doing, uh, the more you can make informed decisions about how you want to set your bike up. And even if you go through the ShockWiz and go, you know, I set it up according to the ShockWiz and it just wasn't for me, uh, you've at least done a very thorough and methodical look at how your suspension set up. And I think that's a worthwhile thing as well. So I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions about it, um, by all means, hit me up in the comments. I'll do my best to try and answer it. The ShockWiz website has tons of information on it as well. And the app itself is just super, super intuitive. So just follow along with what it's telling you and, and you'll be dialed in in no time. But as always, you know, thanks for watching. If you don't mind, we'd love it if you'd subscribe. Uh, we can keep doing more videos like this and as, long, as well as all the other stuff that we're doing. So uh, really appreciate those of you that watch this. And if you have already subscribed, thank you tons. And even if you don't do any of that, make sure that you get rad every day. Thanks, guys. Later.